It marks one month since Britain voted to leave the EU. It seems like longer, doesn't it? A lifetime, in fact. A result that surprised the pollsters, the pundits, the country and the world. Recently on the show, we had an in-campaigner reflecting on what went wrong. And today, we're going to hear from a central figure in the Leave campaign about their astonishing victory. Here's Vote Leave's chief executive, Matthew Elliott, with his account of how the referendum was won. <laughs> So Big Ben has struck 10 o'clock, and we can now start trying to discover which side thinks has carried the day. At 10 p.m. on the 23rd of June, the consensus was that Vote Leave had lost. A contact of mine, number 10, texted me to say, you're toast. And even Nigel Farage was predicting a Remain victory. But after our final conference call with Boris Johnson, Michael Gove, and Dominic Cummings, our campaign director, Giza Stewart and I were still upbeat. People were talking that we'd lost, the evidence wasn't there. And of course, as the evening went by, it became clearer and clearer that we were winning. But I did not accept it until David Dimbleby said, we can now officially declare that Vote Leaf has won. And that's when I think I punched there. <laughs> The UK has voted to leave the European Union. Yeah! I kept saying we need two speeches, but this was not really reciprocated. I think the, the, the mood was we only need a speech to concede defeat gracefully, but uh, you and I didn't quite see it that way. Getting to that point was a long road. Five years ago, I ran the No to AV referendum campaign. I took on this challenge as a test run for a possible EU referendum. We managed to turn public opinion from being two to one in favour of electoral reform to being two to one against. Alongside me at No to AV was Peter Crudus. When I joined No to AV, it was a bit political. It needed that injection of business knowledge. And I think the same applied to Vote Leave. We had uh, a big board, we had a big cross-section of people. What I brought was this business acumen. Having the funding and the right campaign team in place at Vote Leave was essential. But we had three big battles to fight. We were taking on the establishment, we were fighting UKIP, and we had to overcome the natural bias in referendums towards the status quo. To take on the establishment, we needed to recruit big beasts from the cabinet. We needed to show swing voters that serious people from politics, business and other walks of life backed voting leave. If you look back to 1975, one of the reasons why the Leave campaign then was so unsuccessful is because the leading political figures were seen as very much outliers, in some cases even extremists. Um, so to demonstrate that there were senior, sort of moderate, centrist figures campaigning to leave the European Union, I hope, made a real contribution to the result of the referendum. But at the same time as taking on the establishment, we were also fighting UKIP and Nigel Farage. We knew that swing voters didn't want to feel they were voting UKIP by voting leave. Resisting the overtures from UKIP so we could create a properly cross-party campaign was probably the toughest aspect of the referendum for the campaign team. At one point, the group closest to UKIP, Leave.EU, sent out a statement to MPs and the media saying that Dominic Cummings and I couldn't run a sweet shop. And Nigel Farage appeared on the Daily Politics to say that both of us should be sacked. This was a massively stressful period and the pressure was really on. But we weren't out to make friends, we were out to win the campaign. A week before the referendum, we were riding high. Vote Leave had punctured a hole in Project Fear by organising 60 MPs to say they would vote against George Osborne's Brexit budget. And we had the wind in our sails. But then, Nigel Farage unveiled the most controversial poster of the referendum. The breaking point image was damaging enough, but in the context of Joe Cox's murder, it threatened to wreck our chances of winning. Thankfully, it was clear to voters that UKIP was not part of Vote Leave. The final challenge we faced was to overcome the natural status quo bias of any referendum campaign. As was the case with the alternative vote or Scottish independence, the change side often loses as people's natural caution kicks in. 
We had to show how there was no status quo. We highlighted the risks of remain, and we showed how leave was the safer option. Getting to what people feel rather than what they say is where the future of research is and this is what we did and the one key thing that emerged on this was the strength of emotional connectivity with that take control argument. So that single message was actually a, a, actually a decision of genius in many ways because it was exactly what people could understand was something that people just got it cut through straight away to so many people. At Vote Leave, we were challenged for telling voters that the UK is billed £350 million each week for our membership of the EU. It's a legitimate figure, it's entirely the right figure. But we emblazoned this figure on our bus and on our literature, and our spokespeople repeated it again and again. I make no apologies for this. We had our facts, we had our messages and they worked. In direct comparison to the, uh, the arguments for Remain around the perceived impact on the economy in, in a head-to-head -head question, if you like, the £350 million question won every time by uh, a striking distance. At heart, I'm a policy wonk before I'm a referendum campaigner. At Vote Leave, we probably achieved the biggest policy change ever in the history of campaigning. A month on, the repercussions from Vote Leave's victory have already been immense. The economic scares that people predicted haven't materialised. British politics has been turned upside down. And even the European Union is showing signs of reform. As Liam Fox wrote on Vote Leave's whiteboard on referendum night, don't just read history, write it. And Matthew Elliott joins us now. Is it true there was only one speech written for that night? I was with, actually, Gisela Stewart, who did seem astounded by the result, delighted but astounded that Leave had won, and the only speech that had been written was the one to concede defeat. I think the more difficult speech to make would have been the one conceding defeat and working out how to do. A victory <laughs> speech is always easier to write, so you do it more on the cuff. But you have an answer, so was there only one, then? There was only one formally written, but right. at about midnight... Uh, well, you were... started scribbling away on her victory acceptance speech. Right. You say you were always confident that you would win, but not everyone in Vote Leave was so sure. I think from sort of February, once we saw the deal, once we saw the terrain, we always felt quite sure that if it got to the final stage of the referendum, and it was still 50-50, we were still in contention, mm. then we could actually get across the line and win, because we knew that we had our voters more enthusiastic, and also we felt our ground game was better. Right, and on the ground game, let's talk about that £350 million figure, because you say you make no apology for it, but you promised something you couldn't deliver, and you knew you couldn't deliver £350 million being spent on the NHS, so you lied, effectively. I disagree. A referendum campaign is very different to um, an election, in the sense that... You don't have to tell the truth. We're a campaign team, we're campaigning for a certain result, and we hoped that the government would use that money for the NHS. Right, of but course, you didn't say that. Didn't you said, let's give our NHS the £350 million the EU takes every week. That was disputed, that £350 million was sent to the EU. In fact, it was disproved that it was actually sent to the EU. But then to promise that amount of money, which then people distanced themselves from immediately afterwards, was dishonest. And the key point was that it could have been delivered by the government. We would like, like to have been delivered by the government, but... Uh, vote leave didn't become the government afterwards. Right. What about the infighting that went on? I mean, you talked about that. You said that was very difficult to deal with. Was it something that really undermined the vote leave campaign? The key point was that we always had the vision of basically a cross-party, business-led campaign involving people from senior people from politics, business, the military, other walks of life. That was the best way of actually convincing those swing voters that actually it was a moderate, sensible, mainstream thing to do to vote leave. And that's why it's important that we weren't dominated by UKIP and had our separate independent campaign. You were on the Leave side, um, Fraser. Were you surprised? 
Yes, I was uh, really surprised. I don't know any journalist, actually, who predicted that Leave would win. I mean, the polls repeatedly told us otherwise. Of course, we knew not to trust them from last time around, but you'd think they'd have the house in order if they didn't. And um, the momentum seemed to be going with the government's side. When you think about, you're pretty much every single member of the establishment on behalf of the status quo, the government, the opposition, the Bank of England, all these economists, and you had this ragtag bag, if you don't mind me calling you that, Matthew, <laughs> of, um, of insurgents on the other side. So uh, I don't know anybody who predicted a Brexit victory, but one arrived in what was certainly the most extraordinary political victory, I think, in our living memory. But it feels like a lifetime now since the vote, or it does to us anyway. Uh, Boris Johnson and Michael Gove, key personalities in that Leave campaign. They won the war, if you like, but they just haven't been anywhere in the peace. Mm. Well, he, Boris is foreign secretary. Uh, so, but one of the extraordinary things about politics is that the... What, what follows a tumultuous event that you've just brilliantly described um, is, is never logical. And so you have a Remain Prime Minister in place, albeit one who kept a very low profile during the referendum. Michael Gove, nowhere to be seen. And if uh, you're like, the Boris Johnson thing was a surprise even to him, I think, uh, you know, in the end. What, becoming Foreign Secretary? Yes. Uh, but he had two surprises. Michael Gove suddenly standing, yes. which is an extraordinary sort of Shakespearean drama. And then returning, where many people were saying, oh, well, he's going back to sort of writing his books on Shakespeare and things. And that was a major um, weakness, though, I think, in the campaign, that there was no follow-through. The lack of organisation was just draw-dropping, staggering, and, I think, indefensible. Right. I mean, on that, yeah. looking ahead, what about a group being formed to hold the Brexit mm. department to account, to watch for any, as you would no doubt see it, backsliding? I would see it slightly differently. I think there's a need for a group to work with the government. You have groups like the Centre for Social Justice who work very closely with Ian Duncan Smith or groups like the New School Network working with Michael Gove when he was at the Department for Education. So there might be a need for a group to actually help expand on the idea, help you Do you know, think flesh there out should the plan. be one? I think there should be, yes. And would you be part of that? We'll have to wait and see. Right. I mean, this is what's being talked about now, is holding mm -hmm. the government to account. Absolutely. I tell you, the most important thing, to my mind, is the status of EU immigrants. Throughout the campaign, everybody in Brexit said there should be no question that the EU immigrants will stay here. No question of repatriation. And Nigel Farage said that. Every political party said that. Theresa May broke from this consensus, and now she has put the skids under three million EU nationals living in Britain. They're being sent letters up in Scotland saying, well, you're safe for now, but maybe you might get sent back later on. An but awful thing, and somebody should be holding her to account from that. Nobody but you is. see, the, the lack of precision in the immediate aftermath, I, I don't blame the Brexiteers. They had to win a campaign, and they won it. I don't blame what you did about the NHS. All's fair in a campaign. I, I blame David Cameron for offering this thing in the first place, um, a, a sort of binary referendum on mm. in or out, uh, where no one was under any pressure to explain what out would mean in any great detail. You had a campaign to win, but that's a different objective, which you did brilliantly. Um, and that is the problem with referendums. Mm. I understand why he felt he had to call it, but they are... Uh, are, are dangerous devices because you then, once it's called, you just focus on how you win it. And, and the threshold now issue is we also face quite... the consequences, yes. and no one is entirely sure what Brexit is going to mean. Did you enjoy it? I loved it. Mm. Mm. So, however you, difficult it was, would you, have fighting, said that you still if you enjoyed lost, it. Yeah. <laughs> if you had lost, would you have still said in retrospect? You it was it. a tough year. It was a really tough year, but it feels a great sense of achievement. Well, yes, because you won, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think it would have been much tougher if you lost, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't. So, thank you very much. <laughs>